Welcome to Heaven Awaits. If this is your first time checking this channel out, I'm glad to have you here. My name is Jen, and I will be filling in for Lee until he comes back. As Lee did before me, I too will be narrating the near-death experiences of those who have died and have seen the other side. These videos are meant to bring hope to a sometimes hopeless world and to show people that there is indeed life after death. If you enjoy these videos, please consider hitting the thumbs up Subscribe and bell icons to be notified of new content. Doing so is free, and it does help the channel grow. To the return viewers, welcome back. Sit back, relax, grab a cup of coffee or tea, and enjoy today's narration. Today's experience was posted on the Near Death Experience Research Foundation website by Bianca. After a severe allergic reaction to nausea medication, Bianca dies and finds herself in a peaceful place and then finds herself outside of her body witnessing multiple things happening around her. She then says that she saw her uncle who had passed on long ago, who gave her messages to give to her family. I was at work as usual and decided to go to the canteen for lunch around 1 p.m. I couldn't finish my meal as I started to have severe pain in my stomach. I managed to return to my desk and decided to get some water. After taking a sip, I collapsed, and a colleague called for help. I was conscious during this whole time. The cramping and subsequent pain increased, and an ambulance was called. After initial checks, I was taken to a local hospital. My manager accompanied me as I had no relatives nearby. The doctor in charge of my care carried out various tests, and after the results were confirmed, I was admitted. I was told that I had three specks of kidney stones— which they would observe and, if required, would be treated later. My daughter arrived with some of my personal things, and my manager left at this point. Throughout the day, I had regular checks, and as the pain was increasing, I was given additional painkillers via an intravenous drip. At this point, I also started to have a raised temperature and nausea. I was taken into an observation room and kept on the drip. A doctor would come regularly to check on me. They wouldn't give me any other medication in case this aggravated the kidney stones. It was getting late, and my daughter left with my niece whilst my sister-in-law stayed behind. We were chatting generally about the family and work when I started to vomit. My sister-in-law asked a nurse to give me something for the nausea. In the meantime, I told my sister-in-law to call my brother to come and pick her up as it was getting very late. By this time, it was coming up to 10 p.m., and I knew she had come straight from work and hadn't eaten anything. She called him and waited in the room for him to come. The nurses and doctors were meeting outside the nurse's station for a shift handover. I remember saying to the nurse my nausea was getting worse. She informed me that she was not able to give me anything until it was cleared with the doctor, and this meant I had to wait until the handover was completed. At about 10.15, the doctor who had been treating me during the day popped his head into the room to say he was leaving and wished me well. He had instructed the nurse to give me anti-nausea medication via the drip, which would help ease the nausea. My sister-in-law was standing to the right side of me, and the nurse started to inject the medication into the drip line. While she was doing this, I turned to my sister-in-law to tell her that it was okay for her to go, as my brother had phoned her that he was parked downstairs. I remember this to be the last clear instruction I heard or gave. Slowly, my eyes began to draw closed, and I felt heavy and my breathing was getting slower. I felt limp and unable to move at all. I was extremely heavy. I remember me being pulled away out of the bed, but my physical body was lying limp. At this stage, I could still hear everything but could not acknowledge or move. I can see the nurse pushing the alarm, but not with my eyes. It was as if I was looking at her from somewhere else. It wasn't working, and she was screaming at my sister-in-law to go to the room next door and push the alarm. I remember the nurse trying to give me oxygen, but the equipment was faulty. I could see so many people around me frantically doing things to me. A lot of noise, a lot of movement. I was in the middle of all of it, but not there at the same time. I remember hearing the doctor shouting my name aloud and his name, telling me to stay with him. Someone kept flashing something bright in my eyes. I wanted to blink but couldn't. I just wanted to sleep. I kept trying to sleep but the doctor and nurse kept shouting loud to stay with them. I heard another nurse say the heart was in cardiac arrest and they started resuscitation. They punched my chest with an injection. 
I kept thinking that this should hurt, but it didn't. I couldn't feel anything, just felt extremely tired, heavy, and sinking. There was so much confusion. I could see everything, but not from my body. I can't explain where I was, but I was not in the body. I have no concept of where I was in the room. The doctor was telling someone that my pupils had dilated and that I wasn't reacting to the light they were constantly flashing in my eyes. I saw a female doctor or nurse, don't know who, do the same. I wanted to blink, but couldn't. Then someone was pinching me very hard on my inner arm, thigh, and collarbone. Again, I wanted to move, but couldn't. Then I heard the doctor say that there wasn't enough oxygen getting to my brain, and they would have to break the nasal bone and insert a tube straight to the brain and get oxygen to my brain like that. Again, I could feel the tube being inserted, but I couldn't feel the pain. I remember thinking this should hurt. All this seemed like a few minutes, but as I later found out, it was hours. I just wanted to slip away, sleep, but the voices kept shouting at me to stay. I was then rushed to another room. I remember a nurse squeezing on a manual oxygen mask and my bed being pushed quickly across the corridor. I was placed in a room next to an old man who was also unconscious and on a ventilator. I could see him, and yet my body was in an enclosed room. I even know what he looked like. He was mid-sixties, had a lot of silvery gray hair, tall and lean with stubble. He smelt of alcohol. I saw him lying with the tubes coming out of him. A few moments later in my own room. I could hear the doctor saying they would try one last time and arrange a CAT scan, as there still was no brain activity. At this point, I went into the sleep. What happened next is very surreal for me. I am lying in a kind of bed. Everything around me is extremely white and bright. I'm in a room but without walls or windows. There is a door but not a structure. I can't see it as a door, but I just know it is. I am looking outwards toward warmth. I don't know if it is the sunshine or the brightness of the light. There is complete peace. Absolute peace. There is noise and again no noise that I recognize. I am so relaxed. I have no fear at all. I can smell or sense an overpowering fragrance I never experienced before. So sweet that there is nothing that I can compare to this world. I am looking at the hills, and yet they were not hills as we see here. Endless space, endless brightness, no horizon, no depth, no structure as such. It was a nothingness, and something at the same time. I wanted to stay forever here. I didn't have memories or thoughts, just sensed things. It was just so tranquil. There was lasting peace. Nothing solid, just emotions. I was lying on a bed, but it was not a bed as such, but some sort of a buoyant platform. I had no fear of anything whatsoever. On the end of my bed was my uncle standing with a walking stick. He looked exactly as I remembered. I lived in a joint family for most of my formative years with this uncle and his family. When I was one year old, my parents had my brother who was born very prematurely. In those days, children in this condition were less likely to survive. My mother was preoccupied with my brother's care in the hospital for a long time, leaving me in the care of my grandparents, auntie and uncle and family. My bond has always been very strong with both my aunt and uncle. We separated for a few years and reunited under one roof again when we moved to the UK. We carried on living together for four years until separating again when the families were too big to be living in one house. I still shared that bond with my uncle, aunt, and grandmother. Even growing up, I always turned to them for my needs before my parents. Over the coming years, we saw little of each other. I was married and moved away and they got on with their lives. My grandmother died in 1997, my aunt died of cancer in 2003, and my uncle died in February 2008 the same year I had my experience. My uncle died after experiencing a fall at home and subsequently falling into a coma. The incident was very unpleasant as his family and mine were not talking to each other. My father, his only living relative, was barred from seeing him in the hospital and after a lot of painful confrontations. My father was allowed to visit him. During the last hours of his life, I was at his bedside and ultimately when the life support was turned off. I was standing with all the family by the bedside, watching as his life was slowly withered away. I passed out just before he was pronounced dead, 
and so was not actually there when this moment had come. It was a very unhappy, confrontational episode, which left a bad experience for all. My father and uncle had been through a very tough childhood and only had each other for support. My grandmother went blind when my father was two and my uncle was five. They were brought up by an uncle and aunt who didn't look after them properly. Both my father and his brother were close because of this, and even during the hectic family argumentative years. My father helped to financially look after all the family until we went our separate ways. So for my father to be barred from seeing his brother was a very painful experience for all, and I always felt that my uncle somehow was not happy about it either. He never woke up from his coma. In my experience, my uncle was first standing at the end of the bed, then came and sat by my side. He was jolly and happy, just like in life. He chuckled and spoke to me, but not in words. I understood, but not in a way I can explain. He told me to tell the eldest of my brothers, the one who was born prematurely, not to worry. He was going to get through the difficulties just like when he was born. He told me to tell him don't work too hard. It wasn't good for his health. My brother had been working 16-hour shifts as a bus driver. This was something he did after the death of my uncle. He told me to tell my youngest brother not to worry too much, everything would be fine. He said to tell him you are always worrying, and it wasn't going to change anything and that everything was going to be okay. My younger brother had lost his son at the age of one and hadn't recovered from it. My uncle used to chuckle a lot, and when he did this, his stomach would bounce. I used to make him laugh on purpose just to see this. While he was sitting, he told me to stop making him laugh as his stomach was hurting. I can't remember what I was saying that made him laugh. I can't remember what I sounded like or appeared as, but that some exchanges were made between us. How we communicated is not clear. I just knew what he was saying without words. That's all I remember of him except that he felt very peaceful and comforting. He did not give any messages to his own family at all. I wanted to stay there with him, or at least in this place. I finally remember coming around and feeling very, very, very angry. I didn't want to come back. I was so angry with the doctor. I didn't want to come back. Why did he bring me back? All I could think of was I didn't want to be here and was so angry. I was in and out of consciousness and can't remember anything else. Gradually, I started to feel stronger and my senses started to return. Eventually, I was allowed to drink something really sweet as my sugar levels had dropped so much. I remember the nurse saying to me that I had given them a real fright. She was the same nurse who gave me the medication before I had the cardiac arrest, and even though her shift had ended, she stayed behind until I was in the clear. I felt very sad after. I didn't want to talk to anyone, didn't want to be around. I found it difficult to talk about this to my family initially and still do. I never discussed it with anyone for a long time. There were times when I doubted myself, but I know I experienced everything, especially as I had big painful bruises to show for it from when the nurses were pinching me to see if I would react. The whole episode did change my outlook on life. I'm more tolerant and placid. I am detached from worldly things with a different view regarding life and death. I am calmer and positively relate to all my experiences. I want to tell people my story now, but I'm still apprehensive about how people will see it. I have no fear at all of dying or death. I am actually looking forward to it. I feel I'm more mature about things, especially problems to do with health. I don't feel an attachment to things in the way I used to. If something goes wrong, I deal with it in a positive way, even if the outcome is not good. I encourage myself and my family to live life, but not in an extravagant way. I am very religious now and practice Islam. This is the core of my existence, even though I didn't experience meeting angels or God during my experience. I feel I have a purpose to fulfill. I don't know what it is, but know that there is something. I have blind faith and feel that there is something much more, much better waiting for us after death. I am so looking forward to experiencing that feeling again and find that to me being alive is not a blessing. It's a burden. Had it not been for my faith and responsibility toward my children, I might not be around today. That's how coming back to this reality has affected me. One of the permanent ailments I have been left with from my whole episode is I now suffer from epilepsy. This was the direct result of brain damage due to not receiving adequate oxygen supply to the brain during cardiac arrest. 
That does it for Bianca's experience. What did everyone think of her NDE? I know that I am only paid to narrate. This is a question for the nurses and doctors out there. Do they generally break your nose to get oxygen directly to your brain? Inquiring minds would like to know. Anyway, let us know in the comment section below. Until the next video, stay safe and be blessed. Thank you all for staying for the shoutouts to the channel donators, as well as the shoutouts to those of you who watch these videos. Let's get started. Jesus Salvation. Love your work. Thank you so much. Vicki Werner. And Cat. Thank you all once again for contributing to the channel, and again thank everyone for continuing to watch.